All right, so where we worked our way through last time with the prokaryotes is we talked about some of the characteristics of the prokaryotes and some of the, you know, some of the very unique uh, aspects of being a prokaryote, the whole idea behind, you know, asexual reproduction, there's no mixing of genetic information. Uh, and we talked a, a few times during evolution or discussion of evolution that, you know, when you asexually reproduce, right, it's clones, uh, not exactly, right? It, it's very close to being clones. DNA doesn't replicate itself necessarily every time, but that is not a great source of, of, of variation. Now, it can be with these organisms that reproduce, reproduce quite a bit, but prokaryotes have other ways of, of mixing up their genetic information as well. Remember, they, they can actually get together and, 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 and exchange genetic information or like or transfer plasmids from one to the other. <clears throat> Remember, Griffiths work with the mice, the rats, they can actually take up DNA from the environment and incorporate it into their own DNA. Uh, viruses, viruses can act like uh, insect vectors. They can move DNA around. So there's plenty of opportunities for diversification among prokaryotes. And that's why we end up with the groups that we see now, you know, there's uh, the domain eukarya, that's us. But of course there's domain archaea and the domain bacteria. And so what I wanna do today now is kind of just move into each of these domains and each of these groups that you see there and talk about just some basic characteristics uh, about the organisms that are in these groups. Now, again, it, note the fact that what we have done with the prokaryotes in recent years is we've broken, down, broken them down into two separate domains. Uh, when I was in college, there weren't domains. There were kingdoms. That was the highest you went. And all the prokaryotes were dumped into the kingdom Onera at the time. But, uh, you know, as time goes on, especially as some of the classification uh, techniques that we talked about on this slide, like looking at genetic sequences and the hybridization of nuclear acids and all that sort of stuff. You know, we're learning quite a bit more about prokaryotes than just the fact that they were small. And even back in our evolution chapter, I said that's just because of something, the way it looks <clears throat> isn't always a good indicator of its relatedness to other organisms, right? Uh, and some, obviously dogs and wolves and, 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 and coyotes all look alike because of a common ancestry recent common ancestor, but we talked a lot about convergent evolution. And so the fact that all prokaryotes were small, and that was one of the biggest reasons we stuck them into the kingdom Monera, and they all lacked a nucleus, was a pretty broad brush way to classify them. And as time has gone on, we've learned that there's as much difference between different groups of prokaryotes, uh, the Archaeans and the actual domain bacteria, as much difference between them as there is between us. See, we're up the top, we're the eukaryotes in the domain eukarya, which is kind of... Uh, uh, astounding, isn't it? If you think about it, we've learned enough about these single-celled, what we used to just collectively call bacteria, to, to understand that they are as different from one another, even though they're small and they have these very bizarre lifestyles, uh, as, as we are from them. And as a matter of fact, you remember when I showed you this chart initially, the neat thing and the part I put with the red exclamation point <clears throat> is the fact that this indicates right here, this juncture, that uh, us, uh, us eukaryotes, are actually more closely related to the group of prokaryotes that tend to be considered uh, more the extremophiles. Uh, archaea means uh, old or ancient. So that word is given to these prokaryotes because these prokaryotes represent what we believe were maybe uh, the ancestral lines of some of, the, uh, some of the earliest living organisms on the planet. So once again, it is that idea that Aristotle's ladder, that you're moving up the ladder. Uh, once again, we, we see that that's not the case here, right? Because if you look at it this way, at a very broad brush kind of thing, the members of the domain Archaea are more bizarre in terms of relatedness to us in the domain Eukarya than the members of the domain Bacteria, right? On the surface, that is. But when it comes right down to relationships, we're actually more closely related to those extremophiles. Or uh, now there are extreme bacteria as well, but as I said, the domain archaea, archaea is uh, is known. Their 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 motto is of extremophiles. They can live in any particularly any any kind of environment. And we talked about the fact that one of the reasons they're able to deal with these harsh environments is because of a very fundamental difference between their plasma membranes. Right there's the you see the plasma membranes at the top. Those are the eukary eukaryotic ones. And the bacteria, the domain bacteria, the same kind of phospholipid bilayers, but in the archaea, the phospholipid bilayers are 
layered together, all right? So uh, when we talk about a phospholipid bilayer, we're calling these the layers, right? Uh, but when we look at the Archaeans, we have that bilayer of phospholipids, whoops, but we also have them layered together because you see these little points that are sticking out? This is obviously a chemistry shorthand kind of thing. Those allow those phospholipids, uh, or excuse me, those lipid tails to stick together, right? So we not only get some durability kind of across this way, you know, we don't it, just durability. We also get some durability or some uh, some structural durability uh, down this way as well. So in, in an Archean phospholipid, you got those phospholipids, that's the layer, and then these things are sandwiched together. So it's a very, very durable, um, I don't know why this thing all turned blue on there, that's weird. It's a very, very durable way to build a, 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 a membrane. And, and again, remember that the ether bond, and, and, and this not being a chemistry class, I don't care if you know what an ether and ester bond is, but know that the bond, this, this bond that uh, connects the glycerol part of the phospholipids, this part here, to the fatty acids, Remember, that's what a phospholipid is, right? It's a fatty acid where you take off one of the fatty acid tails and you put a phosphate group on it. Uh, notice that in this case, uh, the bond, right? That's what I'm talking about right there. Those bonds that connect those two together are different. And the ether bond in Archaeans, uh, chemically, ether bonds are much more resistant to hydrolysis. They're much more resistant to being torn apart by water. So again, uh, an indication of how... Uh, uh, how durable they are. So let's take a look at some of these. I think this is probably the last slide I did, but it's a good place to pick up anyway. Again, the extremophiles. Uh, so extreme in terms of where they live, they can live down in the swamps and the muds where it's just nasty, where there's no oxygen in some cases. And that's why we have uh, organisms that would go obligate anaerobes. Obligate anaerobes die in the presence of oxygen. Remember, oxygen is bad for you. Oxygen sucks the electrons off of you. It's planned obsolescence. It's killing you. Every time you inhale, you need the oxygen, but you're actually causing destruction of your body at the same time. Now, as we go through life, we repair that uh, destruction, but by the time always wins. And well, we could say oxygen always gets its, uh, gets its prey, right? Eventually, it does tear us down. One of those weird things about life, right? You need it, but it's also killing you at the same time. Just say no to O2. So I tell everybody, just stop breathing. But then there's that other problem, of course, called respiration. All right, now, so some of these extremophiles can be extreme in the terms of way they, uh, uh, their nutritional modes. Remember, I showed you that very complicated slide of the fact that um, prokaryotes can do things like, oh my God, they can get energy off of the, off of the oxidation of iron. They can oxidize sulfur. They can oxidize something and then use the energy from that to oxidize some organic compound. So you put them pretty much anywhere. And, 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 and I'm gonna expand that for just a second. If you put them anywhere, perhaps even away from Earth, that's, what, that, that, that's kind of that interesting thing about astrobiology and where did life come from? We have indications that organisms that live on Earth today uh, have the ability to live in these extreme kinds of conditions. So perhaps these extreme kinds of conditions that you might find in, you know, interplanetary bodies, uh, comets or, or meteors, you know, this is kind of where I started the chapter. For example, some of the Archaeans are methanogens. In other words, the only thing they need in order to uh, liberate energy or to get the energy that's needed for their metabolic needs is carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And let me tell you what, folks, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the, in the universe, and there's even a heck of a lot more hydrogen. Uh, what is it? I've heard 99% of all the elemental makeup of the universe, that elemental makeup, that big chart that hangs in your chemistry class with all those, what is it, 110 elements or something like that, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and all that sort of stuff. 99% uh, of the universe, 99% of the universe is made up of, of, of one element, hydrogen. The other 1% is all those other elements. So hydrogen is extremely plentiful. Carbon dioxide is extremely plentiful. And what they do is they actually oxidize hydrogen. Now always think, always think in chemistry and biology, fitting those two together, when something is oxidized, energy is released. Okay, when something is oxidized, energy is released. When something's reduced, energy is needed. It's the whole, remember, the endergonic and the exergonic. So when you oxidize uh, hydrogen as a methanogen, 
what you do is you release energy, just like we release energy when we oxidize food, you know, glucose. Now, in the end, what that does chemically is it produces methane. So methane is the waste product, all right? Uh, and that's what I was saying the other day. If you're walking through a swamp, many times you might smell that methane. Methane is that, well, methane is that, everybody knows what methane smells like. It's got that uh, flatulent smell to it, all right? Um, and, and this is another interesting thing about astrobiology. Uh, when we're looking for evidence of life on other planetary bodies, one of the ways we do that is we can analyze the light that's coming off this planetary body. Say we think this thing is a planet, right? We analyze the light and we can, we can actually get a chemical signature off the different wavelengths of light that are coming off the planet. That's why they can say it appears that this planet may have water because we're reading that in the, you know, we can't see it with a telescope. These doggone things are so too far away. Uh, but we can analyze the light with these very special machines and say, ooh, it looks like there's uh, evidence of water on the planet. One of the biggest discoveries you'll ever be, one of the things that will shake the world is when somebody comes back and says, we've analyzed the light from this distant body, and it looks as if this planetary thing uh, has chlorophyll on it. Is that there's chlorophyll on this planet. Now, why would that be so incredible? Think about that for a second. Why would that be so incredible if we looked out across space at something that was light years away and we said, wow, looks like there's chlorophyll on that planet. What would that tell you about that planet? I think this was even in a movie years ago, some sci-fi movie, if I remember correctly. What do organisms use chlorophyll? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, if there's chlorophyll, there's plants. And if there's plants, there's life. Now, okay, is there a possibility that chlorophyll is produced out there for a reason other than photosynthesis? Yeah, maybe, but really parsimony, right? Really the simplest solution. Uh, everything we know that photosynthesizes it, on Earth, right? We don't know about other things photosynthesizing elsewhere, uses chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a very unique molecule with very unique properties. You learned about in bio one. So finding chlorophyll would be evidence of something photosynthesizing. Likewise, finding evidence of methane. Now, methane's a little different. There are other processes that produce methane. Volcanoes, for example, produce methane. But if we see a chemical signature of methane, okay, maybe that's another one. Maybe that's another, you remember how science works? Little bits of evidence at a time. So here we say, oh, it looks like it's got water. Looks like it's got chlorophyll. Hmm, looks like it's got methane. Ah, that might indicate that there's something going on over there, right? Um, halophiles and thermophiles. Halophiles, halo is salt, so they can live in really salty conditions. Uh, what did I say? That it's like 27% salt, and the ocean's only 3.5%. You know how dry that is, so that, that's pretty extreme. And in hot conditions, too. Uh, thermophiles, the, these are the bacteria that can live in the boiling water of the geysers, like, uh, what's that one out Yellowstone? Oh, faithful where the water is, is near the boiling temperature, near 100 degrees Celsius. Some of these have optimum temperatures, temperatures they work best at, not ones they can just deal with, folks. Not ones they can just deal with. I mean, we all know in Florida in the summertime, you can deal with 98 degree weather and 90% and humidity, right? But it's not optimum. You're not out there, if you're exercising, for example, you're probably not optimizing at your, uh, you're not probably not exercising at your optimum when it's that hot and humid, right? I know for myself from being a runner, it's a lot nicer when it's cooler and, and the humidity's down a little bit. I feel a lot more, I feel a lot stronger running, so I, I'm more optimum. But these guys are optimum at temperatures approaching boiling, 60 to 80 degrees. My goodness, it's just incredible. So again, think about these guys as being the ability to live in really, really, really harsh conditions. Maybe, maybe such harsh conditions that they might be what we would be looking for on other planets, right? The big thing about life on other planets, folks, is it's not necessarily this whole idea of another advanced civilization who's maybe, you know, trying to reach us and we're trying to reach them and maybe they send a USO, Uf, USO a UFO to come look at us most planetary biologists, uh, bio, uh, most astrobiologists would tell you that the big thing we're looking for is at least relatively simple life, prokaryotic, prokaryotic type life. Okay. Let's move on to the bacteria now. The bacteria, uh, the domain bacteria is grouped into five, uh, uh, well, it's grouped 
uh, it's grouped into a clay proteobacteria, which broken down into five different groups that we give them just uh, letter names, alpha, beta, gamma, and the other two on the next screen are delta and epsilon. So these are all under the clade proteobacteria. Now, proteobacteria are all gram negative. So under a microscope, what color are they gonna look? If you gram stain a gram negative bacteria, what color is gonna look under a microscope? Gram negative. Remember, gram stain is purple, right? So if it's gram negative, it's gonna look red. There we go, right? I, like, again, gram positive purple, right? The P's kind of keep me going there. All right, so these guys are all gram negative. And I mentioned before that uh, gram negative bacteria are uh, a source of interest in us in many cases because they're uh, often, oftentimes a pathogenic bacteria is a gram negative one. So a gram stain is a good way for a, 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 a clinic, a lab, to uh, kind of narrow down what sort of bacterial infection you might have. Uh, but not all gram negative bacteria are bad, and there are some gram positives that are pathogens as well. So anyway, all right, let's look at the, the alpha group. The alpha group are, are usually associated with a host, typically a eukaryotic host, like you see in the picture on the right there, the alpha subgroup. Uh, rhizobium, it's pointing to with the arrows, it's inside the root cell of a, a legume, a bean plant, okay? And at and, and times these can be symbionts or they can be parasites. And, and, and actually, looking at that, I don't like the way those words are put. Symbiotic means living side by side. So even if that symbiotic relationship is not beneficial to both of you, it's still a symbiotic relationship, okay? So parasites are examples of a symbiotic relationship. Parasites gain a benefit and they damage the host, just like a predator and prey, still a symbiotic relationship. Uh, the good uh, symbiotes though, the ones that actually do a benefit for organisms, these alpha proteobacteria, uh, what they do is they fix atmospheric nitrogen. Remember plants, uh, nitrogen is limiting to them, to their growth. That's why when you buy fertilizer, it's got a lot of nitrogen in them. Uh, and even though the air is 80% nitrogen, plants can't use, they can't use gaseous nitrogen. They got to have bacteria that turn it into things like nitrates and nitrites. I showed you this earlier when I was looking at, the, or showing you the different metabolic ways uh, they make a living. So fixing nitrogen is beneficial for the plant because these bacteria take atmospheric nitrogen, turn it into something the plant can use. Uh, we very often will find these kind of bacteria li living in legumes, bean plants. Bean plants, uh, uh, in general, are very good uh, as far as uh, introducing nitrogen into the soil. And they don't do it, the bacteria do. But if you pull up a bean plant, the roots of a bean plant will very often have these little nodules all over them, lumps. And those nodules are basically huge concentrations of these of these uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria and the nitrogen gas uh, extends a bit down into the soil right and so that atmospheric nitrogen gas is being uh, taken up uh, by these bacteria that are living in these uh, nodules and and it's concentrating and turning that into into the nitrogen the plants use now and i even have the equation down below man, ammonia the nitrites that sort of stuff uh, beta bacteria fit in this group too uh, in terms of being nitrogen fixers uh, they are typically soil bacteria. Uh, there are other beta bacteria that have nothing to do with fixing nitrogen, but that we're familiar with. This one over on the right-hand side. What term would we use to refer to the shape of that, um, of that organism there? The scientific name is Neisseria gonorrhea. Yes, it's the one that causes gonorrhea, but what, what name would we give to that shape? Or how would we describe it? Madeline, how about you? Any ideas? What name would we give to that organism there? Obviously, this organism comes in twos. There's two of them, right? Two organisms together, two single cells. Okay, well, they're round, right? Caucus is round. There you go. And if it's two round ones together, it's 
diplo cocci, remember? So gonorrhea or the bacterium that causes gonorrhea is a diplococci, diplococci. There we go, diplococci, two of them, okay? All right, and indeed that is the sexually transmitted disease, gonorrhea. So uh, now gamma bacteria, gamma bacteria or sulfur bacteria. And what I mean by sulfur bacteria, sulfur bacteria can use sulfur or, or, or sometimes hydrogen sulfide uh, as a way to release energy. You're going to find uh, a lot of sulfur, not a lot, you're going to find sulfur bacteria down around those uh, geothermal smokers, those vents at the bottom of the ocean that, that give off a lot of hydrogen sulfide. They're basically, remember we talked about little mini underwater volcanoes. Um, you can see there's Thio margarita nambiensis. That was the one I showed you at the beginning, the really big one that's about, was it, three quarters of a millimeter big? So that's uh, massive for a prokaryote. Uh, you can see all the sulfur, that's the waste product from their uh, process of, uh, of metabolism using sulfur. Lots of sulfur in the early earth, by the way, folks. Lots of sulfur coming out of uh, volcanoes and all that sort of stuff. A lot of gamma bacteria are, are pathogenic. Uh, e. coli that we hear a lot about. Although E. coli is normally, normally E. coli is non-pathogenic. So uh, when someone tells you, well, E. coli is a natural part of, 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 the, of you, what we call your gut flora, of your microbiota gut flora, the stuff in your gut, uh, you don't need to worry about, oh my God, am I going to get sick? Uh, it all has to do with strains. Uh, among prokaryotes and, and microbiologists, uh, we talk about strains of organisms. Strains would be equivalent to like breeds of dogs, right? They're all, they're all the same species, uh, but uh, one's a Doberman and one's a Yorkie and all that sort of stuff. Same thing. Uh, it's the strain of E. coli, uh, a particular strain of E. coli that can that is pathogenic. So E. coli, we say, is a, a normal resident. It's a normal uh, bacterium found uh, in the lower intestinal gut of warm-blooded vertebrates. You being a warm-blooded vertebrate and having a lower intestinal gut means you have E. coli, right? The non-pathogenic. If you got the pathogenic, then you're sick. <clears throat> Legionnaire's disease, that's kind of uh, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, Legionella is a, a gamma proteobacteria. Uh, I, Legionnaire's disease was named after, oh, and I don't know, there's some official name for the group of these group of guys, American Legion or something like that. They had a conference in Philadelphia. This was like when I was in high school, 1976, 77, 78, somewhere around there. And many of them after the conference went home and got this disease and some of them died. Uh, we didn't, we weren't aware of this disease at all, this Legionnaire's disease. We weren't aware of this organism, this Legionella that was uh, killing them. So it was discovered at the time. Again, like I said, we oftentimes <laughs> hear about uh, uh, bacteria when they've done something bad. Uh, but what was going on, they traced it to the, uh, I believe it was the air conditioner vents. Stuff was growing in the air conditioner vents and then it was aerating out or you know, it became an aerosol and infected these people. And as I said, a lot of them. A lot of them died and definitely got sick. Uh, salmonella, really intensive uh, type of food poisoning, can cause death. Uh, can cause death in, in, in one of the ways is by heat dehydration, because with salmonella you often have copious amounts of diarrhea. People can die from excessive amounts of diarrhea because diarrhea is your body flushing out with water. Of course, that water is needed by your body, but your body's trying to flush something out. I actually got salmonella poisoning about. Oh, four or five years ago, God, it was it, it was like having the worst stomach cramps you can ever imagine, and then about ten times that. It was to the point where like you, I could hardly get out of bed. It felt so bad. Doctor gave me some heavy duty antibiotic that finally got rid of it. A salmonella is such a a, a problem as far as a, a, a food poisoning issue that it was a few weeks after uh, I started feeling a lot better. I got a call from. Uh, Seminole County Health Services. My name had been reported as someone who had had salmonella. So they asked me, you know, where did I eat? And do, do I have any idea what I ate that gave it to me? And what was the restaurant? And I, I think I know what restaurant it was. But the problem was my wife and I both I ate the same food. So I, I, I really don't know if they ever figured out exactly what it was. 
Um, another gamma of proteobacteria that's uh, bothersome, obviously, is Vibrio cholerae. V Vibrio cholerae causes cholera. Cholera is a, it is a disease, uh, a, a, a serious disease. Cholera is one of those ones I'm talking about that many times folks who die from cholera die from dehydration, massive diarrhea that it causes. Uh, the delta and the epsilon, delta, delta bacteria can move along with what we call gliding motility. Remember, we talked about motility, motility in prokaryotes early on, and we said uh, many of them use a flagella, uh, different than the flagella in eukaryotes. That's a really cool convergent ev evolution thing. Um, but uh, some of them, like these uh, delta uh, a group of bacteria, what they do is they secrete these slimy threads. So think about the, they, they have these slimy, sticky threads that they secrete, and then they kind of pull themselves along, right? So these threads come out, grab onto the environment, they pull themselves on and pull themselves along. Um, <clears throat> mixobacterium, over here on the right, the fruiting body of a mixobacterium. Mixo is a term we usually use to refer to fungi, okay? And the reason why that word got into these organisms, now these are not fungus, this is a bacterium, is because the fruiting bodies, if you remember in lab when we looked at the, uh, uh, the club fungus, right? When we looked at the club fungus, and we saw these little, uh, uh, well, the clubs uh, sticking off. And we talked about that's where the spores are made. It looks like that's what you got here, doesn't it? It looks like club fungus. So at, initially, we, that's what we thought it was. So it was, it was actually uh, uh, classified as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a fungus. But then initially, it was, then eventually moved over to the bacteria. And it forms the fruiting bodies, though, for the same reason that we talked about in, uh, in, in fungi are the same reason that lecture that I had you guys listen to talks about. Fruiting bodies are, are gonna be formed when the environment is changing, uh, either getting good uh, or perhaps getting bad, right? Getting dehydrated, food scarcity, that sort of stuff. The, 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 uh, the, the mixobacterium actually even in the fruiting body does produce spores. So this is another really cool example of uh, convergent evolution, right? You got uh, uh, this bacterium and fungi producing spores in a similar fashion. Uh, Della Vibrio, this is a cool one. There's Della Vibrio attacking a Pseudomonas. Della Vibrio is one with a big tail. These are very, uh, these are quite predator, predatory and voracious, and they can they can move really fast. Uh, 100 microns a second, uh, which isn't much to you and I, but uh, in their scale, that's moving us moving around about 220 miles an hour. So that's pretty damn fast. And if you're a predator, you can imagine moving that fast is, is, is advantageous. And then not only can they move really fast, but the way they get into Pseudomonas, the way they puncture a hole through, because that's what they do, they're going to puncture through and basically digest the internal uh, material, is they have these digestive enzymes and then a drill, a drill-like structure uh, on the tip of their nose. I don't have a nose. But they spin like 100 revolutions a second, and they drill into their prey. Life kind of, kind of looks uh, uh, kind of looks pretty rough there for prokaryotes, doesn't it? You got these things that can you imagine if we were dealing with predators out there in the wild that could run 200 miles an hour? I mean, heck, I popped. I could run maybe 10 miles an hour for a few for a few minutes. I wouldn't have a chance. All right, and finally the epsilon one, and those are kind of neat because. For so many years, people suffered from stomach ulcers, and it was told that it was stress, and in many cases, it is, and, and genetics, and all this kind of stuff. But uh, as of uh, recently, not too recently, I can't remember exactly when this came about, but uh, relatively recent, we have discovered that there's also, in some cases, an actual bacteria that causes stomach ulcers. Uh, epsilon bacteria in general, ep epsilon proteobacteria in general, are usually pathogenic to humans. But the one specifically for the stomach was called Heliobacter pylori. You see it on the right-hand side. And that's the cause of some, some stomach ulcers. Uh, I, I guess the good thing about that, though, is if you are someone who's suffering from stomach ulcers and this is what's causing it, then simply antibiotics will take care of it. Right? A good dose of antibiotics will kill off the Heliobacter. Your, your stomach will be fine. If this isn't why you're getting stomach ulcers, then then that's not going to help, unfortunately. All right. All right. So that's the uh, that's the cl uh, clay proteobacteria. Uh, now, another member of the domain bacteria are the organisms we call the helps if I click the right arrow. 
Let's try that again. There we go. The chlamydias. All right, chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease. It's survive. It's dependent. It's a. It's a. It's a parasite. It's dependent. Dependent upon animal hosts. You can see in the picture there, on the right, the uh, arrows are pointing in uh, to the chlamydia, a uh, bacterial organism inside animal cells. Uh, cl chlamydia trichomatis is uh, the most common uh, cause of blindness worldwide. Um, and if, if, if I remember it correctly, one of the ways that chlamydia can cause blindness is during the birth process as the child passes through the birth canal. If the mother has chlamydia, the chlamydia uh, organism can get into the eyes of the baby that's being born and cause blindness. And I believe this is why they used to put, uh, right after birth, I remember them doing it to my daughter and son. It was very, it was very kind of weird. They put drops of, I think it was silver nitrate into the eyes. Doesn't hurt you, but what it does is silver nitrate would kill any of the chlamydia. Because I recall them doing it to my son. And when I asked why, I was like, my wife doesn't have chlamydia. And they're like, no, 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 they do it as a precaution. They do it to every baby because I, I don't know if they do that anymore, to be honest. Um, but anyway, also NGU or NSU, non-gonococcal urethritis, and NSU is non-specific urethritis. Uh, this is an infection of the urethra, the, the tube that leads from your bladder uh, that you urinate through. Uh, this is the most common STD in the United States. You can see in the graph down below, whereas gonorrhea and uh, syphilis has diminished, right? Gonorrhea has dropped down quite a bit. Gonorrhea is relatively easy to treat with uh, penicillin, but notice that chlamydia in the blue, uh, since what, 84, has actually increased dramatically. It's because it's a silent STD. You guys know what we mean when we say something is silent, a silent disease or a silent sexually transmitted disease? What, what does the silent mean? Non-reactive or non-symptomatic, that's right. So you have it and you don't know you have it. So what happens if you don't know you have chlamydia because it's it, it, it's not showing up symptomatically and and I think, is it different in males and females too? In one, in one sex, it's a lot more silent than the other. But of course, if you don't know you have the disease, you might continue to engage in sexual activity and you're spreading the disease unknowingly because you don't know that you have it. And that probably explains a lot of why the rates of chlamydia have gone up and I, I was looking at this early before class started, and, and, I, and I was thinking to myself, well, syphilis and, and, and gonorrhea dropping down probably has a lot to do with public awareness and, uh, and, and medications and the fact that they, they are symptomatic. Um, uh, syphilis at least initially is, and then it kind of goes into a stage where it's not. But um, gonor or chlamydia rising, I wonder if, if that has a lot to do with people feeling, well, unprotected sex is a little bit safer now because they've got all these things by which you can fix anything you get. Chlamydia and gonorrhea is nothing more than a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, syphilis and gonorrhea is nothing more than a few shots, trips to the doctors. Not quite that simple, by the way, but I wonder if that's what's gone on with our attitudes. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with we're actually becoming more aware of how uh, prevalent the disease is in the environment. So if you think about if it is more silent in males and a female comes up with chlamydia, uh, the male's like, hey, hey, where'd you get the chlamydia? Well, then maybe we can test him and find out that, well, it's you, dude, because you have, you're have you silent. You know, it's not expressing itself, which is what I always told my kids, you know, the whole, and you don't need to get the lecture on it, but you never, when you sleep with somebody or have that kind of contact with somebody, you have contact with everybody they've ever slept with. And if anything is being passed and nobody's aware of it or they're not telling you, uh, you're taking a heck of a risk. Spirochetes. Spirochetes are spiral in shape. Uh, a lot of free living ones, but some of the better or better ones. Some of the more well-known ones are the parasitic ones. For example, Treponema pallidum. Uh, that's the one that causes syphilis. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease. There's the organism in the picture in black. It's definitely a spiral. There's the deer tick. Uh, the deer tick is the vector, right? The, uh, uh, the organism lives inside the deer tick. Deer ticks are blood suckers. And like mosquitoes and all blood suckers, whenever they take a blood meal, the first thing that a blood sucker must do is it must um, 
uh, stop your blood from clotting. When a blood sucker inserts its proboscis, its blood sucking device into your capillary, the first thing that your body's gonna wanna do is clot because that's a puncture. Uh, and it, it, drinking clotted, you can't drink clotted blood. It's like, it's like trying to suck a frozen milkshake through a straw, right? It, it's too thick. So what the blood suckers do, ticks and mosquitoes and, and their relatives, is they inject a little bit of an anticoagulant into your body first, and that keeps the blood flowing until they get their blood meal. The itchiness from the mosquito bites, uh, that's what you're, you're having an allergic reaction to what they injected into your, into your body to keep the blood flowing. Well, if there's any sort of disease, any sort of parasite, protozoan or bacteria or otherwise, that's in that organism, when they inject a little bit of that uh, anticoagulant, a little bit of that bacterium or that parasite or that protozoan gets into you as well. Um, evidences of Lyme disease that, uh, you know, if you're out running around the wild, <clears throat> you, there's a chance of coming to contact. In men, it's more silent. Thank you, Madeline. That's, that, that, that may be what it is then, right? The fact that you think, well, I can, don't need to use a condom because I have, uh, you know, easy ways to control. Although syphilis is weird. Syphilis is one of those diseases that shows up, uh, shows up like a rash, and then it goes away for sometimes years, and then it shows up again in a neurological uh, fashion. It, it starts to affect uh, an individual neurologically. So it goes into, uh, what do they call it? Uh, let's say hibernation. It goes into a state where it's not active, but it's still in your body. So if you walk around the woods, you bit by a tick and you look in the mirror one day and you see this uh, sort of uh, target shaped uh, uh, design, uh, you might want to get yourself to a doctor. Lyme disease is not a big problem here in Florida. We do have it. it we do have deer ticks. Uh, Lyme disease is more prevalent amongst deer ticks found uh, in conversations with my microbiology buddies here uh, up at more the, near the Midwest. So it doesn't mean you can't get it here, uh, but it's not quite as prevalent here as it is in other places. All right, we looked at these guys under the microscope the other day. Remember, we looked at Anabina, Oscillatoria, and I don't have Glowio caps up here, but we looked at Glowio capsa too. Uh, and these are the only prokaryotes who can photosynthesize like eukaryotes do. So we talked about that in lab, right? These organisms being some of the first organisms on the planet would have been extremely important to changing the planet, right? They oxygenated the planet. Because photosynthesis, the chemical aspect of photosynthesis, the chemical reaction that occurs, oxygen is produced. You remember that from bio one. Now back in the early earth, there wasn't any oxygen. There were no oxygen users. A lot of the early earth organisms were, remember, uh, anaerobes. They died when oxygen rose. But oxygen began to rise in the atmosphere and those critters who could survive the oxygen found a new use for it. The new use for it is the efficiency you get from using oxygen to break down organic compounds, right? You remember, if you're doing it without oxygen, you get two ATPs from a glucose. I'm going back to bio one now, but if you're using oxygen, you get 34 to 36, 40, you get you know 18 to 20 times more energy. So that drives more efficient respiration, more efficient metabolism, bigger critters. That's what the oxygen revolution is all about. So it's bad for some, but not for others. And since these organisms can grow in these massive blooms, that's what you're seeing in the picture in the lower right. Look at those two lakes side by side. The one closest to us uh, with the uh, blue-green color to it is suffering an algae bloom, an algal bloom. Um, it, it, what I mean by that is uh, algae are, 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 are like plants. They need uh, nutrients and, and like fertilizers and things like that. So if you get a lot of runoff, and this happens a lot around uh, golf courses. Golf courses use a tremendous amount of fertilizer to keep those lawns looking nice and green, but they use many times an excess amount of fertilizer. The excess drains into waterways, maybe collects in a lake like this, and then the algae that are there are like, whoa, look at all this nitrogen. Boo, let's grow, let's grow, let's grow, let's bloom. It's a party. And they start about, uh, reproducing. And before you know it, you get this green pea soup color. I mean, compare that to the lake that's just on the other side of that burn, right? Now, algal blooms, you would think, well, that's good because you're making lots of food for things that eat them. Well, the problem is organisms that photosynthesize also respire, right? 
Remember, plants photosynthesize and respire. So when you get a bloom like this, yeah, you're getting a boatload of photosynthesis. You're getting a boatload of food that's produced, but you're producing a lot of organisms that also use oxygen. So you actually are using the oxygen faster than you're producing it. So what happens to the other organisms in the lake, the fish, what they do is they start to suffer from lack of oxygen. Uh, sometimes during algal blooms, uh, blooms, blooms, algal blooms, uh, especially if it's warm, because there's another chemical thing that goes on there. Uh, liquids hold less gas when they're warm. And oxygen is a gas. So lakes here in Florida in the summertime have less oxygen in them. And when the oxygen levels get too low in a lake, a fish, which has gills and is trying to extract oxygen out of water, can't. And they'll sometimes come up to the surface of the lake and you can see them sometimes and they'll actually be looking like they're biting at the surface. They're trying to gulp. They're trying to gulp atmospheric air. They're, they're trying to get any air they can. It's not nearly as efficient as using their gills, but you know, maybe it'll do in a pinch. Um, and that's why in Florida, so many uh, ponds and things like that have bubblers. You know, they're, they're oxygenating it. Uh, and oxygenation helps in case there is some sort of an algal bloom or if the temperature rises and the, and the, and the water gets too warm. Oh, and finally, the gram positives. There are the colonial gram positives. The uh, actomycetes, streptomyces is an example of that, very commonly found in many antibiotics. Um, colonial, again, is not multicellular, right, uh, but not single cellular, maybe multicellular, but not tissues. Again, I want to reserve that word tissues for its proper definition, which is really its proper definition is the collection of cells that animals create in their tissues. But we do start to see this well, I don't know, this tendency maybe for organisms to bond together. Remember, even in early on in the discussion, we talked about biofilms and the fact that they'll come together and form these colonies, you know, sometimes just temporarily. But there is still that drive to that. Uh, among the solitary ones are some of the uh, some of the some of the most nefarious kind of prokaryotes out there. There's the ones that cause anthrax, Bacillus anthracis. Uh, anthrax uh, can actually produce spores. I think I showed you. I showed you spores earlier, and anthrax spores um, they form spores inside the organism. That's why it's an endospore. Uh, anthrax spores can survive for quite a long period of time, and all they need to germinate back into a living anthrax, which anthrax can cause death, folks, uh, is a moist uh, 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 environment. So anthrax spores uh, can be inhaled. For example, into your nose, anthrax is not real common in the environment. So I think it's very often found on, in soil, uh, but you can uh, you inhale it in your nose, and the moisture of your nose would then cause the anthrax spores to germinate, and you could get anthrax. Again, don't get all germophobic on I me. Mean, this is not a common organism that's around, but indeed it does. Uh, anthrax uh, uh, toxin is, uh, is pretty strong, too, from what I understand, but it's not like botulism. Botulism, which is a, a, a type of food poison, can be a type of food poisoning, also produces spores, and its toxin is extremely fatal. Look at that. A gram, one gram. Now, if, if you're not quite familiar with picturing in your head the metric system yet, uh, it takes 28 grams, about 28 grams to make an ounce. All right, so a 1 28th of an ounce of, of, of the toxin from, uh, from Clostridium botulinum will kill 10 to 6, what's that, a million? 10 to the 6? Yeah, a million people. It's amazing, right? One gram. It's, it's incredible to think that these organisms have a, such a strong toxin like that. Uh, Staphylococcus fits into this group of cram positives. Uh, Streptococcus, again, a lot of those organisms uh, with names that we usually associate with the bad guys, right, the, the pathogens. But we don't want to leave our discussion of prokaryotes thinking they're all bad because, you know, prokaryotes do good things. You know, for example, in terms of ecology, they're good chemical recyclers, right? They're really good at decomposing and breaking down dead organisms, waste products. They're really good at breaking down things that other things can't break down, like, uh, like lignin. Lignin is, uh, this is the chemical formula for lignin, the chemical not formula, chemical structure. 
big molecule, right? Lignin is not only big, it's a very strong molecule. It's, it, and in the picture you see, there's an electron microscope picture of lignin that, that, that is in the cell walls of plant cells. Lignin is one of the primary components of plant cells. And just like cellulose, its job is to make plant cells tough, strong, to make wood hard, <laughs> okay? Uh, you need a saw to cut wood because of lignin. Uh, and lignin is not easily decomposed, but it, it's a very important source of carbon. Carbon is recycled in the environment. We're a carbon-based life form. So when things die, what the decomposers do is they break down these carbon structures, these organisms uh, or parts of organisms, and they release the carbon back into the environment so other living things can use the carbon. And if you look in here and you remember uh, your chemical shorthand, uh, uh, from bio one, look at all the carbon atoms. They're all over the place, tons of carbon. But anyway, uh, prokaryotes are one of the only ones known to be able to break down lignin. Uh, some fungi can do it too, but without this ability to break down lignin, that'd be a lot of carbon that's lost uh, in the environment. Uh, we talked about the fact that they're also photosynthesizers and, and nitrogen fixers too. Um, now, a, a bit about this idea about symbiosis again, this little chart uh, is a great little way to kind of sum up. Uh, uh, the only one it doesn't have is predation. Uh, but we can put that in there. Predation would fit under parasitism as well. So when we talk about a symbiotic relationship, it's two organisms, and we talk about the effect on either one. So you see on the left, you got species A and below species B, and there's pluses and minuses. So uh, is it a benefit to species A? Uh, the zero would be no effect, or is it, is, is it a detriment? Is it bad for species A? So if it's bad, uh, uh, if it's good for species A, but bad for species B, right? So in other words, species A gains a benefit to the detriment of species B, then it's uh, parasitism or predation, right? If you get eaten, obviously that's not good for you. If you're the host, that's not good for you, but if you're the parasite, that is good for you. Um, a competition is a negative for both. That might be kind of weird because you think, well, in a, in, a, in a competition, shouldn't somebody win? Well, what they mean by competition is you're competing for a resource, food, uh, nesting sites, territory, whatever you want to think about, and neither one of you gets it all right so maybe you 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 out compete the other one and you get 80 percent of the resource but he or she or it or whatever still gets 20 percent so that's why it's a negative for both so it's not an exact negative for both it's not a 50 50 negative it could be a 90 10 it could be a 50 50 it could be a 199 percent but regardless the negative however small it might be means you still don't get everything uh, commensalism is one organism gains a benefit and the other organism has no effect whatsoever. Zero. No. Uh, a good example of that is the white cattle birds that fall around the cows here in Florida. The, uh, well, there's what, three species, e great egrets, snowy egrets, cattle egrets, you know, not the birds with the, with the, with the hooked bills, those are ibis, but the straight bills, egrets. They uh, actually came from Africa. Uh, Founder effect, founder effect. They actually, during a storm or somehow, made their way to South America and moved up through here. Uh, egrets follow cows around because egrets feed on insects. And as the cows are walking, they don't eat the insects, obviously, but they're kicking up the ground and insects are coming up out of the ground and the egrets are eating those. So you see the egret gains a benefit, but the cow doesn't care. The egret doesn't help the cow find food. It doesn't help the cow in any way. It doesn't harm the cow. It doesn't get in the cow's way. It doesn't compete with the cow. But, you know, so the cow says, yeah, sure, I don't care. Mutualism, of course, is the last one. That's when, you know, both benefit, like the clownfish and the sea anemone. Okay? So there are some uh, obviously good prokaryotes out there. They engage in mutualistic relationships with us. I was talking earlier about your, your gut microbiota or your intestinal flora somewhere between five to a, a thousand a, a different uh, species can be part of all this. And I found this chart online and it, it, it's actually, a, it has over 500 different species. Containing on average in your body 10 to the 14 microorganisms, that's 10 followed by 14 zeros. 
And uh, I think it's kind of cool because they break it down. Your stomach has anywhere between 100 to 1,000. Um, your duodenum, anywhere between 10,000 to 100,000. And then the, the number increases as you move down into your colon. This is the whole thing about uh, a, a line in probiotics. If you have stomach issues, uh, uh, upset stomach, uh, just digestive problems, chronic cramps, that kind of stuff, one of the things that might work would be those probiotics because uh, the idea is perhaps your uh, intestinal microflora has been upset, right? Has, it, it, some of the bacteria have died off or, or other bacteria have taken their place and so you replace them with those uh, probiotics. And there's some, there's some science to that too, so it's not just uh, uh, one of those herbal kind of things. Uh, we can use bacteria for genetic, genetic engineering. Remember, they'll take up DNA from the environment, from viruses. You can actually uh, act like that other bacteria and inject a plasmid into one. So you can inject DNA into microorganisms to get them to make something that they don't need themselves, right? Like, for example, uh, in this particular case, we have a species that produces PHA, what polyhydroxyalkanate plastic. It's a plastic but it's a biodegradable plastic. See, a lot of our plastics, at least through history, weren't biodegradable. So you put them in the landfill and you think, oh, they're gone, they're not. They're there millions of years from now. Some of them biodegrade into actually nasty, toxic stuff, but this PHA stuff is a healthy, relatively, biodegradable plastic. And what they do is, uh, and plastics, folks, uh, are hydrocarbons, so it's an organic material like oil, right? Uh, they in, insert this uh, genetic material into the bacterium, and then the bacterium, like in this picture, produces these lumps of, of PHA, of, of plastic, right? Oh, bioremediation. UCF was doing some work on this. This is cool. In bioremediation, there are, there are many species of prokaryotes that naturally feed upon oil. And if you're wondering why would there be that, well, oil leaks into the ocean or oil leaks onto the earth uh, uh through fissures and cracks in the rock it, it doesn't just it isn't just extracted out of the earth by us all right by us using oil wells it's a very it, it's a natural ongoing process that oil leaks right and there are organisms that have adapted oil, oil is energy folks right oil gasoline it makes your car go uh, if you had a way to break down uh, oil you could use it as a source of energy it's food right so there are a, a, a bacteria out there that are naturally hydrocarbon digesting bacteria and what we've done is we've found those bacteria and we've grown them up and we've, and, and, and we've modified them to the point where we now can use them in something called bioremediation, which what that guy with the sprayer is doing, he's not uh, pressure washing the oil off the rocks. I think this is actually from the Exxon Valdez, which was a big tanker that ran aground off Alaska back in the late 80s and just scattered all kinds of oil all over the place. Uh, he's not only just pressure washing the oil off the rocks, in that water there is uh, these uh, uh, bacteria that then would digest the oil. Doesn't happen very fast. That's one of the kind of the sad parts of things like the Exxon Valdez and even the Gulf oil spill in 2010. The oil, much of the oil is still there. Uh, uh, in Prince William Sound, which is where the Exxon Valdez dumped most of its oil, if you walked around through Prince William Sound today, you would never know it was covered in oil. They've cleaned up most of it, but they say if you dig down six inches or a foot into the dirt, you'll come, there's, the oil is still there. There's still plenty of oil. It's the same thing BP tried to tell us out in the Gulf with the Gulf oil spill. We put this dispersant down, which by the way, the dispersant might've actually been worse than the oil when it comes to what it was to the environment, the toxic part. We put the dispersant down and now you can't see the oil, so the oil's gone. Dispersant means it breaks the oil up into little tiny particles. The oil is all still there. It didn't go anywhere. Let's, you know, even those uh, hydrocarbon digesting bacteria couldn't have digested all that oil by now. So, do not believe the hype. Okay, and um, let's take a look at finally some pathogens. So we got the good and the bad, but the pathogens again are the ones we usually hear about. In the early 20th century, believe it or not, about 20% of all children before the age of five died from an infectious disease. 20%, one in five. You know, and, and your parents might be a little bit young, but my mother was born in rural North Dakota back in the 30s to a farming family.
family in a farming community. And I remember her telling me about uh, infant death, infant mortality was, I wouldn't say it was common, but it wasn't uncommon uh, uh, during this time. That the, the folks just didn't understand disease the way they did. They really didn't understand much about how microorganisms were causing disease. A lot of that had to do with technology. We had microscopes, but microscopes that were well enough to be able to see these bacteria and the techniques by which to cultivate these bacteria. So this unseen thing was causing death. It's pretty difficult to try to figure out how to battle an unseen thing. We see them a lot more now, know a lot more about them, but we still have problems. Uh, for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that's the picture on the right, the one that's been color enhanced, which basically affects your respiratory system. Tuberculosis basically means uh, you're gonna drown in your own lungs. It causes your lungs to fill with fluid. Kill people for thousands of years and then was gone. We used to put people in, in sanitariums. If you had tuberculosis, you wouldn't lived in a, in a sanitarium with other people with tuberculosis so that hopefully you didn't get anybody else sick. I remember it was funny when I lived in San Diego when I was in the Navy, there was an old building up the road, very odd looking in, uh, institutional like looking building. And some of the old neighbors that lived there told me that's what it was, that it was actually a, an old uh, tuberculosis sanitarium. Uh, so we got rid of tuberculosis, everything's fine, right? Well, because we know about evolution, if you're treating these organisms with an antibiotic, you're going to get some of them that it doesn't affect, right? You're going to get some of the organisms that it doesn't affect, and those organisms that it doesn't affect are going to be the ones that reproduce. And now we have MDR strains, you know, these multi-drug resistant strains. We talked about the exotoxins. That's usually what causes these symptoms. Um, in the gram-negative species, those lipopolysaccharides can, re can reduce uh, endotoxins. Uh, the difference re between endo and exo is exotoxins can cause the disease even when the organism is not there, right? So the organism could die off, but that toxin can still be there and cause the disease symptoms. Uh, a tetanus, which causes the muscle seizures, it it's not the the critter tetanus that does it, it's the toxin that tetanus releases. And of course, the pathogens, as we said, one of the problems or one of the things that they can do that are problematic for us is they can do that horizontal gene transfer, right? They can actually pass genes back and forth. So you can create virulent or disease-causing strains out of normally ones that don't. This is what happened to E. coli. Uh, see the E. coli down there, those are the strain, 0157H7. That's the strain. And that E. coli, uh, through transduction, transduction is when a virus acts as a vector, a phage. A bacteriophage is a virus. A phage DNA has been found, the actual vector that's been found that, that moved the gene into E. coli that turned it from non-pathogenic to, uh, to pathogenic. And oftentimes, it's something as simple, like for example, in the picture, the genes that they get are genes so they can produce those adhesive fimbriae those extensions of the cell, you can see them all in the picture there, that allow it to attach to things, right? So sometimes it's just a matter of giving the pathogen the ability to stick to its host that makes it pathogenic, okay? But remember now, you know, let's not get germophobic about this. There's tons of microorganisms out there. Most of them, most of them are involved in, a, in, 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 in are not involved in a symbiotic relationship with us. They're not parasites. They're not hosts. Well, they couldn't be hosts. <laughs> they're not uh, 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 commensals. They just kind of do their thing, and we do our thing. All right. Any questions on uh, prokaryotes? Because that's it for that chapter. I do want to move into the protozoans next. Let me start the protozoans. I won't finish the protozoans. Let me get those slides loaded. You guys are thinking about that. Time is it? Oh, good, perfect. There we go. One more time. I clicked on protozoan and you gave me bacteria. There we go. All right. Protos. Protozoans. Interesting group of organisms. All right. Now, put this in your notes to start with. Protozoans are the base.
for all other critters on the planet or all other organisms. They're the base. They're the base group. All other critters, uh, the fungus, the animals, and the plants, right? Because that's the three groups we have left after the protozoans, because we do the prokaryotes, the protozoans, and then the three I just mentioned. All three of those descended from protozoan ancestors. And they didn't all descend from the same protozoan ancestor. You see what I mean on the next chart in just a second. But uh, the discovery and our knowledge of protozoans, like our knowledge and our discovery about prokaryotes, has a lot to do with technology. Right. As we got better at building microscopes, because years ago, if you were wanted to be a microbiology kind of guy, you wanted to look at protozoans or or or, or bacteria. And bacteria would have been even harder back then. If you wanted to do that, you had to either build your own microscope or you had to go find somebody, hopefully, that knew how to build microscopes. All right. And, and hopefully that person built good microscopes so that these microscopes were usable. Uh, and then once that microscope was built, you could then use it to make your observations. Like Robert Hooke, not a horribly attractive man, Mr. Hooke. But anyway, Robert Hooke looked at cork cells. And these are the pictures that he drew of cork cells. This is one of the reasons I make you draw things in, uh, in, in, in your micro or in your labs, right? Robert Hooke did it. It helps you remember. It helps you get the detail down. These are cells from a cork tree. This is where, remember, Hooke got the name cells because they look like very regular cells that you might see, in his case, he said, in a monastery, where monks would live in a monastery. Uh, so we're here we are in 17th century. Now, the guy down below, Anton von Leyenhoek, uh, 1632, so again, 18th century, late, uh, mid 17th, uh, early 18th century. He also had a microscope. Uh, there's his microscope. I always think it's so neat back then how they just put such effort into making things really fancy, you know? Why, why do you need to make that microscope so so fancy, you know, with all the gradu on it? But nonetheless, there's his microscope, and and I love this quote of his. Yeah, it, it, the reason why it, I remember being, oh, fifth or sixth grade, maybe younger, not fifth grade, maybe fourth. Anyway, and the teacher getting us a drop of pond water, which is what we're going to do tomorrow in the lab. We're going to look at some pond water as well. But the teacher getting a drop of pond water and bringing it into the classroom, put it under a microscope, and, and myself looking through a microscope for the first time and seeing all the critters swimming around in there. I thought, holy cow, it's a whole nother world in there. Now, Von Leyenhoek said it a little bit more elegant than I did in the sixth grade. He said, no more pleasant sight has met my eye than this. And you're so excited about seeing this. Even though back then these people were very reserved, they they you know they still had these glimpses of jumping up and down saying, wow, that's so cool when you look under a microscope, kind of like I did as a kid going, holy cow, look at this stuff. I never knew this stuff was here, right? Well, now the stuff, what was the stuff, all right? At the time, we knew there were animals, okay? We knew there were plants. We knew there was a third weird kind of critter called a fungus. You know, we suspected a bacteria. What were these things? You know, they didn't photosynthesize, although some of them can. They moved, and plants don't move, and fungus don't move, but animals move. So Van Leeuwenhoek called them animacules. Animacules being animal-like things. Now, technically, protozoans are not animals, okay? Protozoans are protozoans. But you can see where back then, not knowing any different, uh, you would say, where do I classify this thing? Just like we talked about you know, early on in, 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 the, in our evolution discussions, what's it look like? Well, it looks like cat. It looks like a cat. Maybe it belongs with the cats. And if you get in a very broad sort of way of looking at it, you say, all right, here's something uh, that I'm looking at on a microscope. It moves. So it's probably not a plant. It moves by itself. I can see that it's swimming. And plants can float. I get it. Uh, uh, it's moving by itself. Wow. Uh, plants don't do that. Fungus don't do that. Um, uh, so maybe it's an animal-like thing. So let's start with that. All right. Not a, good, not a bad place to start. Uh, and not so far off because they are sort of animal-like. And they are sort of plant-like. As I said, they're the base for everything. All right. Protestant diversity. Most eukaryotes are protists, all right? Most eukaryotes. In other words, uh, the fungus, the plants, and the animals, if you added them all up, most critters on the planet that are eukaryotes, protozoans, plants, animals, and fungus, protozoans are the most numerous. And they are, as I said, the base group. 
other eukaryotes arose from them. So I'll come back to what that all says right there for a second, but look at that at that uh, at that cladogram on the right, right? That the relationship. All right, now we're going to be talking about different groups of zoans. We're going to be talking about the excavata group. We're going to be talking about the sarclade. We're going to be talking about the archaeoblastida. And we'll also talk about the unicana. Now, those are four groups of protozoans, okay? Four clades, four groups, four um, uh, uh, divisions of protozoans. But what I want you to notice is that in especially these last two groups, there's a mixture, right? The archaeoblastids include the red algae. They include the chlorophytes, which are, uh, along with the chlorophytes, are what we call green algae. And they include the land plants. Well, land plants aren't protozoans. Land plants are in a different kingdom. You know, we, this kingdom protista, which, by the way, as, as we're discovering as we go through this, kingdom protista is polyphyletic, right? Kingdom protista is polyphyletic because what we're doing here in the kingdom protista is we're saying that all these organisms, these protozoans, uh, when we talk about protozoans, we're talking about their common ancestor and all their descendants, if it was monophyletic. But we can't talk about protozoans as a common ancestor and all their descendants because what I got in red, that's not a protozoan. Fungi is not a protozoan. And animals are not protozoans. But all the stuff in the yellow around them, the coanoflagellates, the slime molds, the entamoebas, the amoebas, uh, the algae that I talked about, those are protozoans. So let me ask you a question because you know how to read one of these now. Look at land plants. Are land plants more closely related to other protozoans or to animals? So my question is, land plants, closest relative, another protozoan or us animals? Remember how to read the chart, right? Another protozoan, right? Or another protist. Okay, yeah, another protist, right? Because right here is the relationship between land plants and karyophytes. And karyophytes are, ooh, karyophytes have one foot in the protist world, one foot in the, in the, in the land plant world. Okay, so remember again, it's not a ladder, Aristotle, it's not a ladder, uh, but indeed karyophytes and chlorophytes and green algaes and red algaes are all protozoans, protozoan, protozoan. I mean, we got to go all the way back to here before we have a common ancestor between land plants and animals. Now, look at fungus. This is kind of cool. A fungus or fungi are actually uh, uh, more closely related to animals than they are to land plants. And a fungus is more closely related to another type of protozoan, a nuclearid. See the thing in the yellow above it? And animals are more closely related to a protozoan called a coanoflagellate. Kind of cool, right? So that's what I mean about protozoans being the stem base group for everything else. Everything in yellow is protozoans. Everything in red are not protozoans, but you can see that they are related to protozoans. In some cases, relatively closely related, more so than they are to each other. Neat, huh? So it's like what happened on Earth is we had this evolution of life. We had uh, uh, prokaryotes. And then from prokaryotes, we made a bunch of these protozoan critters. And then out of them, a few of those branches gave rise to the big critters on Earth, the land plants and the fungus and the animals and all of us. Protozoans are like uh, uh, prokaryotes in the fact that uh, most of them are unicellular, some are colonial, some are multicellular. And when does it become colonial? When does it stop being colonial and, being, and it's multicellular? And when is it multicellular, not colonial? Yeah, you know, it's in between. I, I would guess it probably has a lot to do with the definition of how much they cooperate with one another. If there's a lot of cooperating going on, then maybe you call it multicellular. And if there isn't, and, and maybe colonial multicellular are, are synonyms, right? But not tissues again. Nutritionally diverse, these organisms can photosynthesize, they can be heterotrophs, 
they can carry on a, a, a variety of ways of extracting energy. They can reproduce asexually, just divide in half, or sexually, technically sexually. I put it in quotes. Remember the technical definition of sexual reproduction is uh, gametes coming together or, or genetic information coming together. So we'll talk more about why sexual in this case is in quotes, because it's not the same kind of sexual reproduction that we think of. There's bad ones, there's beneficial ones, uh, there's mobile ones, there's sessile ones, there's just all kinds of them. Uh, we no longer, we no longer technically call it a kingdom protista anymore. In bio one, we still teach kingdom protista because the jury is out on what we should do with these group of protozoans. Uh, those uh, different groups that I showed you at the beginning, the excavata, the sarclades, and all those, uh, those are being suggested as protozoan kingdoms, right? But then what do you do with the unicanta? You can't make the, the, very, the one at the bottom. My pen again decided to stop work. It's down here. You can't make it kingdom unicanta because in that kingdom, there's going to be protozoans and things that are definitely not protozoans. All right. So if you're really interested in protozoans and you're really interested in the classification, the taxonomy of protozoans, this is your gig here, man. This is what you want to do, because this is where a lot of the work is going on. Still, I mean, all kinds of suggestions and ideas, but we still haven't broken it up completely yet the way we want it. All right. Now, we talked about endosymbiosis back in evolution. We said endosymbiosis was one of the ways that those organisms that were being you know, being run off by the oxygen that was rising in the air. It's one of the ways they survived. They became, they, they, they end up living inside of another organism. And I and remember at the time I said, that's where uh, we believe the origin of mitochondria and, and chloroplasts came from. All right, so just to review again, because we also have evidence in protozoans of what we call secondary endosymbiosis. All right, so start back on the left-hand side, and this is very similar to what we talked about in evolution. We had a heterotrophic eukaryote heterotrophic eukaryote. In other words, it does not photosynthesize. And remember, eukaryotes have this pension or this desire, if you will, to want to engulf things. So a heterotrophic eukaryote engulfs a cyanobacterium. Cyanobacterium are, another name for them, blue-green algae. Blue-green algae photosynthesize. All right, so now this heterotroph can photosynthesize. So maybe that's how we uh, the beginnings of plant cells. And early on, those would have diverged into two lineages. The red algaes, which can photosynthesize, right? They, they don't, well, they use chlorophyll, but they're, they're, they're red in color. We'll talk a little more about why they're red and how come they can still photosynthesize. And then the green algae, which have chlorophyll. And then uh, we believe that what happened in many cases is they underwent a secondary endosymbiosis. Not all red algae, not all green algae, but some red algaes and some green algaes would have been engulfed again. And, and, and we believe that because of the number of membranes that we could see around them, right? You see that once that thing has been engulfed, we can look at the number of membranes and sometimes that gives us an idea of how many engulfings occurred. Uh, and then if it was the red algae, then that's where the dinoflagellates and the stromatopiles, and those are protozoans we'll talk about. Uh, and also in the green uh, algae would be the euglenids and a, a group that we call the chlorarachnophytes, okay? And you can see what I'm talking about here in this picture. Uh, this is inside of a protozoan, and what we have here is a nucleomorph. So this is the remnants of the nucleus of a cell that was engulfed. So this is looking inside of a bigger cell. You're looking at a, at a small picture of it, and that nucleomorph is the remnants of the nucleus of a previous cell that was engulfed. So we've got pretty good evidence for endosymbiosis. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at the excavata first, up at the top, three groups, the diplomonads, the parabasalids, and then the euglenozoids. All right, the excavatas get their name because they have many times a groove on one side of them, and they use that groove for feeding. They use it to excavate, right, to, to actually, uh, what is excavate, to extract food, okay? Uh, Giardia intestinalis is a, a very uh, a, is a very common uh, um, member of this group. This is a diplomonad parasite. Giardia intestinalis 
as the name would imply, causes stomach problems. Uh, the thing about GRDN test analysis, it's uh, sort of misleading as to where you might find it. Uh, diplomonads, all diplomonads, got the DI word right there, all diplomonads have two nuclei. This is another diplomonad right there, but it's got two nuclei, one there and one there. Why did I put blue on blue? You see the two nuclei? It looks like eyes. Two nuclei, multiple flagella, a, a degenerative mitochondria, something called a mitosome. So now we do a little detective work here, right? We see this organism. We see that it's got a mitochondria, but it's very degenerated, right? So it's not really doing its mitochondrial job. Ah, that probably indicates this is an anaerobic critter, or at least an, a, a critter that can that engages in anaerobic respiration probably more frequently than it does aerobic, if aerobic at all. Now back to Giardia for a second. Giardia is a parasite, and Giardia test analysis kind of goes against what you would normally think where a parasite would reside. Nobody walking down the street and the water that collects in the gutters would think, man, I'm thirsty and scoop up a, 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 a cup full of the water in the gutter and take a drink, would they? You, you would almost expect to get sick from that or die. But Giardia intestinalis fools us. This picture, which is a little bit distorted in the focus, is, is of a clear mountain stream, right? And you would think, man, I'm, I'm hiking up here in the woods, this clear mountain stream or lake, it must be clean. Giardia intestinalis, that's one of its favorite places to live. So people will oftentimes take a drink thinking, ah, it's nice and clean and still get sick. And that's why they tell folks, you always need to sterilize the water in the wild before you drink it. Now, I don't always follow that rule, but luckily I haven't gotten sick yet. So if I'm out in the woods and I'm thirsty and I don't, I'll, I'll drink out of the river. Don't bother me at all. All right, I think that's it for time. Yeah, we're at 920, so I'm going to stop it there. We'll do the uh, uh, more of the protozoans tomorrow, and we'll do our protozoan lab tomorrow. If you have any cool uh, ditches or lakes or anything around your house and you want to bring in a sample of water, by all means do that. Try to get some of the stuff off the bottom, some of the, the, the debris on the bottom, if you get near the edge of the lake or the uh, stream, and uh, that's a lot of times we'll find some, some from protozoans in there. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording.